Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event from How To Academy. I'm Nicole, a producer at How To, and I'm so pleased to have you here with us tonight. Tonight, we are joined by esteemed academic, best-selling author, and founding director of University College London's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, Professor Mariana Mazzucato. She is joined by her doctoral student and political economist, Rosie Collington, whose research is published widely and recognized widely. They will be delivering an introduction and joining co-founder and editor-in-chief of the news movement and former editorial director at BBC News, Kamal Ahmed, for a groundbreaking roundtable discussion. This will be followed by audience questions, and at the end of the event, Books can be purchased outside, and there will also be a book signing. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage Professor Mariana Mazzucato, Rosie Collington, and Kamal Ahmed. Brilliant. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a seat. I'll go there. We almost got locked in the basement there, so <laughs> apologies for the slightly tardy uh, start. Mariana, Rosie, welcome. Welcome to all of you uh, up there, down here at the Conway Hall. What a fantastic chat we are going to have. Now, I have a copy of the book you must all buy. And cheer. Cheer the book. Thank you very much. And I know it's a good read for one reason. Look how dog-eared this thing is already with notes and annotations and pen marks that I've made uh, throughout. This book has been in the bath with me. It has been in bed with me. My partner's here somewhere. Polly, where's Polly? Put your hand up. She's here somewhere. She's had this book almost as her second boyfriend Wait, is she for here? the past... Where is she? We can't start Where without you, Polly? Polly. Anyway, she's, she's here somewhere. She's shouting. I can hear her. Oh my God. My goodness. Hello. 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 Um, um, uh, so you can see it's a good book. Now, the reason it's a good book that Marianne and Rosie have written is not just because it's brilliantly written and it is tightly argued and it makes a very uh, logical, um, um, uh, uh, historic and economic, uh, builds a historic and economic narrative about um, a long period of time and then looks to the future. The reason this book is good, because it is actually part of a series. And to understand the series that particularly Mariana has been involved in, but now with Rosie also alongside, you have to rewind quite a long way. And you have to go right back, actually, to the Second World, Second World War. Um, and there have been sort of three big stages which set the scene, not just for this book, but for the work that Mariana has done with colleagues, which has um, um, influenced uh, the conversations about economics and politics over uh, more than a decade. At the first stage, let's take 1945 to, to, uh, to 1979. Now, that was a stage where the state was seen as the key uh, provider. Yes, in partnership with the markets in the form of business, in partnership with organised labour in, in the form of unions, but that was the settled what we knew in the UK as the Buskerlite uh, view of politics. And that ran from 45 to 79. Then came, in the UK particularly, uh, a, a new revolution. The Chicago School, the notion that actually the market would provide, because uh, for many people, uh, that Buskerlite consensus had failed. 79, with Margaret Thatcher, and then uh, through the 80s with uh, Ronald Reagan in America, the market will provide, the Chicago School. That crashed and burnt in 2008. And what happened then? We didn't have a replacement. Mm. We didn't have a new narrative about what economics and politics should look like. And Mariana, now with Rosie, has started building a true narrative of what that could look like. And you only need to turn to the, the back cover uh, of this fantastic book and see your other books, uh, Mariana, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public Versus Private Sector Myths, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, The Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. To get a sense of that need, that thirst 
for uh, a new narrative that we can guide ourselves by. And this, the big con, mm -hmm. is almost the latest in that series. And I would urge you to consider the other books that Mariana and those connected to her work have also written. And it's brilliant, Rosie, to have you here on the journey as well. Just a little bit about how this evening is going to go. Uh, Mariana and Rosie are going to give a sort of 10-minute opening uh, to um, their each. work. Each. <laughs> I used to have to interview Mariana for the 10 o'clock news, and you couldn't fit Mariana into a three-minute news package because Mariana always spoke for half an hour. That's not um, true. That's not quite true. But um, uh, so Mariana's going to speak for 10 minutes. Rosie's going to speak for 10 minutes. We'll have a little chat up here on the stage, which will be wonderful. And then we're going to come to you for lots of brilliant questions. I'm told there is a fantastic usher. Uh, up here. I literally can't see anything up there, but I believe there are people. Uh, and there's going to be an usher down here as well. So do, as we get towards um, uh, sort of 7.30, 7.45, start putting your hands up, have some brainy thoughts, and Mariana <coughs> and Rosie will do their best to answer. But Mariana, let me come to you first. The big con, it's the latest in your set of works that, as I say, are creating this new um, narrative. Tell us your thinking behind this book and how it adds to the, that narrative that you've been building. Sure. I am worried that you read so much in bed. That is true. We've got... <laughs> um, uh, what was that? that I was don't know. That was your uh, microphone. Oh, God. You Sorry. carry on speaking. Okay, I'm very bad at, like, order. Um, so thanks for asking it in that way, because actually when you said series, I was actually plotting away a, a Netflix series on this. Um, we do need to rethink the state. This book is not about... Actually, what is it about? The big con is not about like us versus them, good versus bad. Who's been conned? We've all been conned, everyone. Even the consulting companies eventually have been conned because we have no future if we can't actually battle, if we can't challenge, if we can't work together across society on the biggest challenges of our time. And just listen to Greta Thornburg, who's now 18, is she almost 19? When she was already 16, she was like, come on already, blah, 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 blah. Climate change, global warming is what we should actually call it. Change is a bit neutral. Global warming is so bad that it's actually become irreversible, close to being irreversible. The IPCC report tells us every year we have very little time left, and yet we're not acting with the urgency that we require. And when I say we, who? There's no one actor, there's no one public unit, private unit, consultant, or charity, or philanthropy that can solve such a difficult, so-called wicked, challenge like climate change. But similarly with COVID, if you think about it, it you know, hit the world stage and we were found to be globally incredibly unprepared. Just think what happened early on. First of all, we didn't realize how bad it was. We then had a test and trace system, which was quite faulty globally. We had the digital divide, so all these kids locked down. We cannot see any of you, by the way, so I'm just going to keep moving my head as though I'm looking at you, but I do not see you. Uh, the digital divide just increased inequality because so many kids locked down in their homes globally, stopped having access to their human right. We should come back to the issue of human rights uh, to education. Uh, we failed miserably on the vaccine. Why? The vaccine was not the mission. <laughs> it was vaccinating the world. That was the mission. And we have what Dr. Tedros, who I work closely with, he's the head of the World Health Organization, calls vaccine apartheid. So, you know, health challenges, digital divide challenges, climate change challenges, these are incredibly difficult things to tackle. And they require what we call collective intelligence. And what we call out in the book is we don't have that collective intelligence. We have an increasing decimation and hollowing out of one of the most important actors, which is government. Um, we don't say that because we think government is necessarily more important than any other actor, but it's the one that has been kind of <laughs> bashed so much into existence that I often say when I give talks to governments, I say, I've walked in here as a economist, I'm coming out as a life coach or something, because there's actually <laughs> depression within the civil service. This idea, and this is where I kind of began a lot of my work, this idea that government at best can fix market failures means that by design, you are always too little too late. You are by design worried 
which is never a good thing, right? I mean, you do the best things when you're kind of like, you know, uh, psyched up to tackle the big problems that you might have ahead in your life or, or so on and so forth. So the idea that you're patching things up, that you're fixing market failures, that you are at best de-risking who? The cool risk takers uh, in the private sector. You're enabling, you are uh, leveling the playing field for someone else to go play. I don't know why I did baseball. I've never played baseball in my life. So soccer, uh, football, soccer, whatever. anyway, Arsenal, uh, right? So to get to, <laughs> uh, enabling someone else to do the cool stuff. It's just an incredibly problematic setting. In my previous book, Mission Economy, I actually began with uh, Kennedy's speech, which was so important with the Apollo program. He actually said, we're not doing this because it's easy, but because it's hard. So that idea of actually welcoming uncertainty, welcoming difficulties, embracing experimentation, embracing the whole trial and error and error that you need to do, even to learn how to ride a bike. You would never learn how to ride a bike if you were fearful of falling off. Uh, we don't have that within our governments. There's been this idea that, again, you know, at worst, get out of the way. The kind of Thatcherite, Reaganite idea of government is not needed. But at best, you're there to enable the cool value creators to do their thing, and then you might regulate, redistribute, enable, de-risk, all these words you literally want to fall asleep. And this is where then the door opened, opens, because it's active and past, and unfortunately, and hopefully not the future, for others to come in and say, here we are, because you're quite of a basket case, inertial bureaucracy. You're a civil servant. You're kind of important, but you're not a value creator. Um, you're definitely not sexy, you're definitely not creative. Um, where is the cool stuff happening? Again, somewhere else in the economy. So we will help you deliver. And, and I use the word deliver, and, and you know, Rosie and I are gonna um, divide some of the issues up tonight, and I'll, I'll let you, Rosie, go a bit more into the history. But one of the, I think, surprising chapters maybe, in fact, I sort of know that you found it surprising because you told me, but I'll pretend I didn't know. <laughs> One of the things that maybe surprised you, yes, is that we don't just talk about this kind of dismantling of government organizations from the so-called kind of neoliberal right, you know, austerity, all these things that we're used to fighting against. By we, I assume that we have a, an audience that sort of <laughs> is friendly towards ideas, but maybe not. Um, it's also the kind of that progressive idea, not only about fixing markets, but that, that kind of new labor idea that, no, 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 hold on, government is important. It, it, it's important for steering. Of course, it shouldn't row. That's for the private sector. And guess what? Government's so important, we're going to make it look like the private sector. We're going to render it more efficient. We're going to introduce cost-benefit analysis and net present value calculations. We'll set up delivery units, right? And that's not really what government is for, right? Government is for doing those moonshots, but around our societal challenges. We need to make sure that, again, every kid has access to digital technology to access today their human right to education during a lockdown. We need to make sure that government is purpose-driven to actually know how to govern a difficult net zero strategy. And we need to know how to govern the next pandemic, which as you all know, I'm sure you're reading all these scary stories about the permafrost melting, new viruses are coming our way. That's what government's for. It's not about proving that it's somehow as efficient as Coca-Cola, as uh, McKinsey, as um, any company, as Pfizer, and so on. It's about actually really catalyzing that society-wide change, bringing many different actors together with a direction, and fostering that by actually designing the tools. Think of all the tools governments have, from procurement, which is government as purchaser, I promise I'm timing myself, I got two minutes left. Um, <laughs> we said 10 minutes each. I I will stop at 10 minutes, eight minutes and six seconds left. Um, so, you know, government is about creating a catalytic change that solves problems. At least that's what I think. That's why I set up this institute where Rosie's doing her PhD, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. So as soon as you take out the purpose away from government and make it seem like at best it's about leveling the playing field, at best it's about facilitating, and that then it needs to help others, life sciences, uh, the creative sector, which you're in, 
um, aer aeronautics, uh, the automobile industry, the Nissan deal, what the hell was that Nissan deal, right? That you're somehow just having to be also business friendly to show that you are serious about your budget, that you are serious about the economy, then you fail. And what the book is about is that the consulting industry, and by the way, we talk about the industry whose business model is about consulting, because there's many consultants out there. There's head teachers that consult, there's doctors who consult, there's nurses who consult, academics consult, based on their expertise, perhaps based on 10, 20, 30 years of doing oncology and then a cancer specialist can consult perhaps for another hospital or for another country. We're talking about an industry that calls itself the consulting industry, that presents itself as creating value, but has actually been surfing, surfing, I'm not gonna say leeching, I won't use that word, surfing on these different trends in capitalism, which have, first of all, been quite dysfunctional, from privatization to outsourcing to talking about climate but not doing climate, but that have been able to enter every room, we talk about being in every room, precisely because of this insecurity within government institutions that have not only been bashed, but have been told they need to deliver based on these very static metrics. And also this fear of taking risks, right? This risk averseness that we have in government, which we don't have in the private sector. I've, I know you have many friends that are venture capitalists. Venture capitalists brag about all the difficulties they had, the failures they had for every success. There was eight or nine uh, 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 failures, right? <coughs> so the civil servants aren't allowed to actually experiment and to fail. So we look at different issues which have actually opened the door, not only because of this massive gap in terms of the capacity within governments, but also in terms of that psychological fear of making a mistake. So it's much easier to rubber stamp it, right? It was a McKinsey climate strategy. And the different examples we look at, I'm about to hand over to, um, to Rosie, are meant to kind of reveal the problems, but we don't do the journalistic thing of just saying, look, this scandal McKinsey helped fuel the opioid crisis, which they did, by the way, or McKinsey or Deloitte and so on ended up running a test and trace system which failed miserably in the UK, which it did. We don't just focus on these scandals because otherwise it would just be spikes, right? We look at the normality of this very dysfunctional situation ecosystem, if we can call it that, where you have a very weak, fearful, risk-averse government which needs that rubber stamp, but also in many ways an uncourageous, sometimes cowardly business sector that when it makes decisions to do things like downsizing, like engaging in a massive share buyback scheme instead of reinvesting profits, likes to, again, rubber stamp that decision with a Deloitte, a KPMG, a PwC, a McKinsey, a Bain, a Boston Consulting Group, rubber stamp because somehow it's gonna be digested more like the, the, the syrup going down the throat. Was it Mary Poppins or The Sound of Music? I can't remember. It'll be digested more by the board. So the, the subtitle of the book is uh, uh, How the Consulting Industry Has Weakened Our Businesses, Infantilized Our Governments, and Warped Our Economies. And I'll just finish by saying that the reason we use that infantilization of government, very strong word, quote or, or word there, is because there was a Tory, again, unexpected, uh, Lord in the UK government who on the back of Brexit and COVID just realized how much money was being wasted on consultants and said, if we continue, it's not just a waste of money, that's just like a money thing, but we are infantilizing Whitehall. We are literally rendering our civil service like babies who do not learn. Why? Because to learn, you need to do. And if you're not doing, you're not learning by doing. And if you're so fearful of making a mistake and constantly saying that someone else has to take the risk, and yet they don't really take the risk because when things go wrong, they're actually not held accountable, you're in trouble. And it was amazing that he called that out. So over to Rosie to give you a bit more. Uh... <laughs> Rosie. Thank you. Oh, I knew that would happen. Um, it's a huge honor to be here this evening. Um, if you had told teenage me when I was playing in these local bands that I would finally have an audience of more than 10 people, <laughs> I'm not sure I would have believed you. Um, but yeah, on a, on a more serious note, if you had told me four years ago when I first met Mariana at a student-run conference at IIPP, where I'm now a PhD student, 
that I would not only go on to do a PhD with her, but would end up co-authoring a book together on such an important issue. Spending the past week in media interviews, being tagged in more posts on LinkedIn than anyone should ever have to read, um, and now speaking to 400 people at Conway Hall, I am uh, absolutely not sure I would have believed you. <laughs> Um, but of course, the past few years have been unusual in other ways. I don't know if, I, if everyone is getting some feedback on the microphones here. We, we were joking earlier that perhaps there's been some consultants in to, uh, <laughs> to do the microphones. They're very slimmed down. Um, <clears throat> it was during lockdown um, at the end of 2020, that a few months into my PhD, that Mariana first invited me to join her in writing The Big Con. Um, we had both been researching, writing about, and professionally coming into contact with the consulting industry um, for quite some time. The global COVID-19 pandemic, which brought tragedy to so many people around the world, also brought to public attention how governments were using the consulting industry, often in ways that were disastrous and, and potentially devastating. In the UK, an estimated £2.5 billion worth of contracts with the consulting industry, that's nine zeros, by the way, um, were awarded by the UK government and public bodies to consultancies in the first year of the pandemic alone. So that's doubled the amount of the previous year. About half of this went to the big four consultancies, Deloitte, EY, KPMG, and uh, PwC with much of it also going to the big strategy consultancy. So that's McKinsey, now a household name for all the wrong reasons that we discussed, um, uh, Boston Consulting Group and, and Bain and & Company. Deloitte fared particularly well in its contracts from the UK government. Um, they were wide ranging. It was contracted to uh, procure PPE for the NHS, so a function that the NHS has done since its inception. Um, to develop digital platforms in the NHS, and, uh, and were even involved in revising the medical research ethics review program for the NHS, so kind of hugely diverse roles that they were involved in. At one point, Deloitte was earning £1 million per day from its contracts for the UK's test and trace program, which a parliamentary inquiry subsequently found, and I quote, had not achieved its main objective to help break chains of COVID-19 transmission and enable people to return to a normal way of life. According to the report, the programme had become overly reliant on expensive contractors and temporary staff, with consultants accounting for nearly half of all test and trace central staff internally. So that's massive. Um, consultancies, in other words, were at the heart of the UK government's pandemic response. And this way of doing things proved itself to be ineffective, inefficient, and wasteful. It failed on its own terms. In the course of researching the book, we actually spoke to someone who had worked in government during the pandemic. And what they described really helps to illustrate what was happening on the ground. So I'm going to read you their quote at length. The impression I had was that the organization stood up so many new teams all at once. So there was always someone new wanting to talk to you about some new thing that was upcoming. But they often didn't know. They didn't even know what they were asking for. It just seemed like every project had loads of wandering Deloitte people. <laughs> and it strikes me that the sheer volume of them that were around created the situation of these zombie emails just arriving all the time, asking really basic questions that we had to respond to, taking our attention away from actual work. Now, that's really quite damning, but equally damning was the finding in the parliamentary inquiry into Test and Trace that the use of consultants was so high because the skills the NHS was trying to recruit for did not exist in the civil service, or they were in, in short supply. In other words, this was a problem with government, as Marianne has discussed. This is a problem with government as much as with the consulting industry itself. Governments around the world today so often lack the capacity to do the things they want to do, the things that they are democratically mandated to do. And when governments are unable to do the things they want to do, that's when they call the consultants. Or more often, that's when the consultants come to them with offers of uh, expertise and the uh, provision of a first contract for free, perhaps, and fresh-faced graduates with these incredible uh, qualifications from top universities around the world. 
There are other reasons that consultancies are brought in that we discuss in the book. So in business, as Marianne has mentioned, they often help to legitimize controversial decisions. Um, for example, between managers and shareholders, but also between managers and trade unions. Um, politicians might also prefer to bring consultants in uh, so that they have someone to blame if something goes wrong, so that they're not uh, kind of the, the headline of the Daily Mail when there, is a, when there is another crisis in government. But as we show in the big con, and as you've also alluded to, Kamal, understanding the roles that the consultancy industry, the consulting industry plays across the economy today and why it exists on such scale and scope as it does, why so many graduates want to go and work in this sector, requires us to go back and understand the history of the consulting industry and its development within capitalism. So in the UK, we find that the growth of consulting contracts, perhaps no surprise, really took off with the arrival of Margaret Thatcher and the theory that the state could not create value for our economies and societies and that things were best left to markets. In the 11 years that she was in office, this is quite an astounding statistic that we discovered as we were writing the book, UK government spending on consultants increased from just £6 million to £246 million. The privatisation of state-owned companies like the railways proved particularly lucrative for them. But perhaps surprisingly, it was under third-way governments around the world from the 1990s that the consulting industry really became embedded across the public sector. The governments of people like Tony Blair in the United Kingdom and Bill Clinton in the United States were guided by this belief that governments were necessary, that they had this important role for guiding the public interest. But they didn't need to do things themselves. If the private sector was offering to do things for less money, and if it was promising to be more cost-efficient in the short term, then it only made sense to contract out to them. So the third way manta, which we discuss in the book, was that government should steer, but not row. What we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, is that this short-term cost-benefit understanding of government capacity can be costly in the long term, in more ways than one. Governments that do not invest internally, that do not row, are unable to steer their economies out of crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. But you'll be pleased to know that it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we're going to tell you a bit about some of the solutions that we found, the things that governments around the world are doing um, it, it, to, to move away from this model, to, to move away from this form of government, this type of government um, that is a government that is not able to steer because it isn't doing any rowing. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to return to something that we discuss in the book, which is the foundation of the NHS. Mariana has written a lot about mission-oriented policy, and in many ways, the NHS, the foundation of the M NHS, was emblematic of the kind of ambition that really must be re-established in governments, the ways, a way of organizing government that we should probably return to to confront the great challenges of our times. So the mission of universal public health required entirely new forms of care provision and organization. Hospitals needed to be built. Medical professionals had to be trained. Administrative systems that were entirely new had to be developed across the population. And achieving this needed resources of the public sector. It needed ambition of the public sector. But it also needed experience across the economy from private and public sector actors. And in fact, management consultancies, we were uh, quite uh, interested to learn um, were, uh, management consultancies were also brought in to help advise the Department of Health on utilities and cleaning practices in the Department of Health at the foundation of the NHS from the sidelines. That's also quite important. Um, and today, this role of the NHS as a source of innovation is so often ignored, but so many medical and public health breakthroughs in the 20th century developed within it, from hip replacement surgery to IVF technology and the world's first heart, lung, and liver transplant. In the UK, we live longer, better lives because of this mission of universal public health. So perhaps, compared to many public sectors of today, this economic and organisational learning, this way of thinking about how to do societies, how to do government, perhaps today, this is more important than ever. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you Rosie. Thank you, Mariana. Now... I have a confession to make. So I'm the only person on this stage that grew up 
in Britain in the 1970s and 1980s. Rosie is obviously far too young and Mariana is far too glamorous to have grown up in Britain in the 1970s and the 1980s. Now, some people in this hall may have grown up, I can't see everybody, but there are some white-haired people in the hall um, who may have also grown up in the 70s and the 1980s. And this is forming my first question, Mariana, because the issue is... Why did this happen? This is a fantastic book on why it happens, but I'd like to, Mariana, for you mm -hmm. to, to, to help us a bit with this. Because Margaret Thatcher, the Chicago School, Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman didn't just sort of appear. There was, um, for those of us who grew up in that era, um, government had appeared to have failed, not just on the moonshots, but on the grubby day-to-day clearing up the bins, paying my benefits, um, making sure that things are kept safe and that the schools are open on time, etc., etc. Because they stopped appearing to the public mm -hmm. to be able to do the dull stuff. And that is why the demand grew so hugely. I'm just wondering, Mariana, where does, if blame is the right word, I don't know that it is, where does the blame lie for the growth? Is it simply that government had actually failed and consultants whatever mm. that might be in that ecology, filled a gap that was necessary to fill? So it's, it's, very, it's a very good way of putting the question, but the problem is that the word government, you know, one of um, Keynes's, John Maynard Keynes's great quotes is that practitioners on the ground who think they're just getting the job done were actually slaves of defunct economic theory. So if you look at government over the last 50 years, but also in different countries, right, there's varieties of capitalism. There's not one way that we do capitalism have been informed by often economic theory, not necessarily by textbooks, but how it gets trickled down, whether it's from the treasuries, but also if we think of the whole Montpellerine society movement, which was kind of an anti-state Chicago school, that's where it ended up being academically, uh, movement, these things don't come out of thin air. There's strong interests in it. So the way you frame the question, which is an incredibly important question, and I will answer it, is as though there's like an experience out there, there's a practice, you know, government does something, it might fail or succeed, and then we learn from that, and if we learn that government can't do something, we, we might go then asking for help. There's almost like an optimistic, almost utopian vision that you have that this is all about evidence. <laughs> and what we talk about in the book is it ain't about evidence. Even when there is huge failures by other actors, we are much more willing and able to blame some actors than others because of the narrative, the discourse, the story we tell ourselves about how the economy is run. And by the way, when you talk about the 70s, don't forget that the moon landing and again, I wrote a book about this, so I just want to say something about it, happened just before that. And it was not only a huge success, but it required a lot of private sector innovation. It wasn't just the state. It wasn't just NASA. It wasn't just aerospace. There was 400,000 people involved. There was industries in business. The word market, let's come back to that, because business and the market are not the same thing. But there was businesses in, in obviously aerospace, but nutrition, materials, electronics, software, if you've seen the film Hidden Figures. Um, you know, amazing the, that the software industry as we know it today was actually an outcome of that moonshot. And so that idea that you actually need, and I kind of began with that, lots of different actors in the private sector and in the public sector has always been the case. It's not like the challenges we have today are so much harder than the challenges we had before. We've always needed actors in different domains. What we've then had is about 50 years of bashing of the public side to the point that the education, it's not, it's not a coincidence I'm an academic, I really believe in education, the education we provide to civil servants, and you see it really starting in the 80s, has been informed by very problematic ideas of what government is for. So if you're a manager and you go to a business school, and there's great business schools out there in this country all over the world, in France, even in France, and uh, <laughs> um, they have these really cool classes, you know, strategic management, organizational behavior, decision sciences. It's all about strategy. 
And the equivalent for an MPA, Masters in Public Administration, is literally just falling down from that kind of old school thinking of you're there to fix markets, be aware of don't crowding out the business sector, be aware that government failure is even worse than market failure. It's literally all about fear to the point that even the tools like procurement, which I'm a complete nerd about because I actually think procurement is this like missed opportunity to really redirect an economy in any country, no matter how small it is, is done, for example, in Italy, where I'm from, where they fear corruption. There's this idea that you know the state might be corrupted, there might be nepotism and so on. In Italy, it's done in an agency called ANAC, l'Agenzia Nazionale dell'Anticorruzione. Everything in Italian sounds great. <laughs> but <laughs> it's the, the, how can you have an outcomes-oriented procurement strategy in an agency that is fearful? The first thing that the head of procurement did in NASA was change how procurement was done from cost plus, cost plus to fixed price. Right? So in the book, we talk about capabilities and capacity. Knowing how to structure a procurement strategy that is outcomes focused and is not just about giving any kind of contract requires intelligence. The same guy who changed NASA procurement in order to foster all that bottom-up innovation that got us camera phones, that got us baby formula, foil blankets, insulation, all these things that had to be solved going up to the moon and back, he started witnessing within NASA, all the outsourcing that was happening already in the 1960s. Don't forget, consulting has actually been around for a very long time, since the 1920s. McKinsey was already consulting with NASA back then, and he said something which is just as damning as the infantilization uh, thing in our um, subtitle. He said, if we continue this, we're going to get captured by brochuremanship. In other words, we won't know which private sector companies to work with. Not, we don't want to work with the private sector. This is not about ideology. It's not about some sort of like, we need to nationalize everything and government is great. Government should do everything and you know, forget consultants or the private sector. No, you need the private sector. You need all sorts of different actors. But if government doesn't know what it's doing, it won't literally even know how to write the terms of reference. It won't know how to sign the contracts. It's going to end up getting a really raw deal. You know, the green deal, the green thing, listen to the science, as Greta tells us, the deal is a new social contract. If you don't know your landscape, if you're not investing in your brain, you won't even understand the world to even know who to work with. And, and it's just a really important point, because this isn't about, I'm going to keep coming back to this, it's not about the state is great, consultants are terrible. When consultants, and, and you were just alluding to that, in the early history of consulting in this country, they really were actually on the sidelines. And why was that important? Well, they didn't necessarily have expertise on the NHS, for example. They were consulting on the side. When they started to do the climate strategy, do the digital governance, do the test and trace, we trace that history of going from the periphery of government to the center at the same time, so they didn't cause it, but they benefited from it at the same time that government becomes more and more insecure of its role, less and less purpose oriented, more and more needing to show its economic value. And I've worked with NASA, I continue to work with NASA and the European Space Agency, it's so interesting. NASA fostered huge amounts of economic growth when it didn't give a beep about economic growth. It really was mission led, got 400,000 people, all those sectors, all those technological spillovers happened because it was focused on a really difficult problem. Today, uh, actually since the mid-1990s, NASA is having to prove ex ante its economic value. Kind of like what's hap been happening in the BBC in recent years in this country, where you have to prove the economic value of the BBC, slowly kind of decimating its own purpose orientation because it has to think ex ante about the value as opposed to ex post by actually fostering a very dynamic, you know, again, public-private partnership. What I'm trying to get to though, Mariana, hmm. Very lovely answer. The actual question I asked is, yeah, the, is the, the why, question? is the why. Yeah. So, so why, yeah. because my point was that that might have been some of the narrative that there was this failure of lowercase g government in some way. Mm -hmm. You've said that's the wrong narrative. So why was consultancy able yeah. to grow in the way it has grown over yeah. time? And then Rose, I want to come to you about some of that history right back to the financial crisis in the US, which I thought was fascinating yeah. about the 1930s. So, the, well, yes. the two things uh, uh, are related. Mm. So I'll do a bit and then please <laughs> come in. So 
the classic accusation of the 1970s period was that government was picking winners. It was deciding, you mentioned British Leyland, which companies, which sectors were going to be the future. Now, if you look at that history, that is very different from that example I just gave. It wasn't a coincidence that I raised the moon landing. It wasn't about a sector. There was not one sector that was important for government to work with. It wasn't an aerospace feat. There was all those different sectors. So there's been many accusations of where government went wrong, for example, an industrial strategy, putting all its bets on a company, on our sector. That itself is not an accusation about government being rubbish. It's about a, des a policy design that really went wrong. And a lot of the work that we do in the Institute is to say, this isn't about government or the private sector. How can we design a policy so it's not about just giving a lot of money to the Pfizer's, to life sciences because of a life sciences strategy, or even to renewable energy? What are the things you're trying to solve, like climate, like health issues, digital divide? And how do you really get all those different sectors, like we did with the moon landing, but apply it to our societal challenges, the sustainable development goals. And that's all of a sudden no longer an ideological thing of government did everything wrong, the private sector is great. It's about there was for a, a long period a policy design by government that just fueled a lot of money in a rent-seeking kind of way, in a way that was easily captured, right? Government was captured by particular sectors, which went very wrong. Can we do it better? Yes. I mean, I've been working on this issue for a long time, this mission-oriented approach. The point of missions is not to just say vision, mission, plan. It's to say a mission-oriented policy is not about fueling and just giving subsidies, guarantees, uh, you know, creating a parasitic relationship between the public and the private sector, but focusing on a problem and galvanizing as many different actors to solve that problem together. To do that, you need capacity, you need capability, but you especially need confidence. NASA had no excess profit clauses in its contracts. Excess profits is what everyone's talking about today in the energy sector where we have a cost of living crisis, where you have mega profits being earned by the energy sector, not because they innovated or did anything great, but because they're able to extract today, given what's happened with prices, huge amounts of profits, which are then being used for areas like share buybacks. NASA back then already knew that was a problem. They said, we need to work with the private sector, but you're not going to turn this into a gambling machine. We're going to socialize the risks, but also socialize the benefits in such a way that is actually embedded in the contracts. I'm saying this might seem like it's not an answer to your question, but it's the answer. In other words, we can only move away from this old kind of Corbinite view that we just have to nationalize everything and it'll be great, or what you're calling a market kind of oriented view, the private sector will be fine and we just need to kind of you know, regulate on the sidelines. Neither one of those are right. It is about the granularity, it's about the details, it's about how do you actually get smart government and how do you get that? You invest within the civil service. Hence the big con is if we continue to outsource that capacity and give up on a sexy, edgy, creative bureaucracy, we are never going to be able to actually tackle the challenges. And the first thing NASA did after the big fire they had, the Apollo 1 fire where three astronauts died, one of those astronauts said, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Because they couldn't hear what was being said in mission control room. So what did NASA do? They brought in uh, one of the heads of Bell Labs, George Mueller, who changed the NASA bureaucracy to have all these different project managers that were in constant communication one with the other but with delegated teams. So this all of government approach, which we had to have with COVID, which we have with wars, where we kind of get money out of the blue, right, to fight wars, that is never applied to our societal problems today. So there's both a willingness failure, we kind of you know, do things with wars that we don't do with our social challenges, but we also require that kind of outcomes orientation, all of government approach, outcomes oriented procurement, which the US government invented after the Korean War, the Defense Production Procurement Act, which then Biden used for the vaccine. We have to get smart government to work in a smart way with the business sector. And the book, by focusing on consulting, it almost becomes an excuse, right? Because it's not, we're not saying consultants are, you know, McKinsey's not the problem, it's, it's a huge problem, but it's not the only problem. We look at that as a microcosm of all the issues I've just talked about. Rosie, take us through some of the history beyond the Thatcher Reaganite period, but it goes, you go way back in the book, and it's a really fascinating narrative you build around 
for example, the financial crisis, the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, mm -hmm. that that allowed um, sort of, it was an unintended consequence of things that were meant to secure it, make the markets more secure, that actually allowed consultancy to flourish. Yeah, I think certainly the kind of early period of consulting was a kind of, it was incidental to wider developments that were happening. Mm. But, um, and, and it's certainly super interesting. I guess to relate it to what Mariana was just saying, with the big con, we use this term not to describe something that just the consulting industry is doing, right? Or just something the governments are doing, but how these two types of actors have co-evolved and what that can tell us about capitalism. What can that tell us about capitalism? That's what we're interested in, in, in finding out. So we also look in the book at um, how consultancies have as we described, ridden the waves of capitalism. So that is related to this um, uh, kind of early history of McKinsey, which managed to do very well out of the Great Depression in the United States um, through kind of spreading the gospel of cost accounting as it was at the time. Um, but also in the post-war period, consultancies grew as uh, economies grew and American forms of business, for example, were spreading across to the UK uh, and, and the rest of Europe. Um, then, as we saw with the kind of 1980s and the liberalization of financial markets, which led to a, a, a kind of reconfiguration of business towards being about maximizing shareholder value. This was not something that the consulting industry invented in itself, but it was able to create new services based on these kind of principles and, and these new forms of government, these new forms of governance that were coming from government or that were being permitted by governments, but that were also making their way into business. Now, this is not to say that this is just a kind of structural phenomenon. This is not just something that the consulting industry has kind of been able to do by riding the waves. There is also huge resources invested within the sector itself in what we call in the book consultology. Um, so this is not just something that, you know, consultancies are not just able to walk into government because governments have suddenly got this new form of capitalism or this new way of doing government that enables, that has opened the door to kind of whoever's going to walk in. No, um, consultancies have invested uh, the big consultancy have, have invested a huge amount in creating oh, the impression that they create value. That's something that we talk about in the book a lot. Mm. Now, what does that look like? That looks like, for example, in the 20th century, ensuring that the big consultancies like McKinsey were recruiting from the elite universities, the top universities of the mm. world. Um, and they did this, and there's a historian, Christopher T. McKenna, who's also written a lot about this, because it helped to create the impression that this was a legitimate profession. This wasn't something like the legal profession, which was uh, kind of much more stringently regulated. You know, they would walk into business and people would turn around and say, you know, you're 22 years old, who the hell are you? Like, what, what, what are you going to be able to tell me to do? Which is a fair comment, um, fair question. And the way that they helped to build this legitimacy at this period was by recruiting from these top schools. There are other things that they have done, for example, establish what we call in the book quasi-academic research institutes. We did have some stronger words that didn't make it into the book to describe these um, institutes, like McKinsey Global Institute, for example, which is staffed by people with top PhDs from top US universities. Um, and certainly, if anyone's ever come across a McKinsey Global Institute report, we're never going to deny that they, are, they, they can be pretty interesting, right? But the people who are writing those reports are not the people who are going into the businesses. They're not the people who are going into governments to do things on these issues. And so it, these reports then serve a function of creating an impression that McKinsey can create value rather than actually kind of being evidence that the firm itself creates value when it goes into organizations. Um, so, they're, yeah, they're very different things. I'm trying to think of other examples that we have for con well, just consultology. One of the, yeah, I mean... So both in the test and trace, right, did, like, is it so surprising that Deloitte failed massively with the UK mm. test and trace system? Not really. Like, was that an area of expertise? So this area, of, this issue of expertise, because, of course, that's like the veil of the value creation is that they're bringing in expertise, which is missing, perhaps also in government institutions, which have been even analyzed from our point of view, decimated over time in terms of capacity. There's those two issues always happening, right? On the one hand, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The less you invest in governments, the more you need someone else to come in and help. But the help that's actually being provided is often quite empty 
in terms of that expertise. It's different if you're going to, say, the Potsdam Institute in Berlin, I just mentioned that because I've been talking all day, with a climate scientist from there to help you with your climate strategy. The actual climate expertise in McKinsey is not that strong, and yet the Australian government decided to give them $6 million to run their climate strategy, which then became uh, very problematic in terms of having all sorts of holes in the modeling. But the bigger question is not that it failed, because, hey, we all might try to do something and it might not go down well. The question is, why didn't they use the internal capacity, which in that case they actually had? They had. They have an organization called CSIRO in Australia, which actually over many decades has actually built that internal capacity around issues around climate change. So even when the capacity is there, not using it, it just kind of exudes this issue of kind of this lack of confidence. Um, my husband's in the room, and he tells me that also in the uh, public broadcasting area in Italy, you know, or in the world, in the cultural sector, the idea of actually not using you know, that, that many governments, even when they're setting out their cultural strategy, aren't necessarily using that decentralized network of knowledge within, say, your local film production companies, but having to have, even in that case, some sort of, you know, cultural strategy being branded, either by Deloitte or McKinsey, just because there's this feeling that somehow that's going to be more professional or show that it's more economically sensible. So kind of breaking down what does it mean to have an economic strategy to be responsible, right, if we think of a lot of the issues that happen with, say, the Labour government in this country, which might win the election, who knows, but that immediately is being told, you're not going to be responsible with your money, right? You have to prove that somehow you know how to deal with the public finances. And not having that confidence to actually create a new story about what it is to run an economy that's purpose-oriented and not to bring in to that notion these kind of old metrics, static metrics of not only efficiency, but of you know, that kind of lack of, um, yeah, I, I, it's not just confidence, it's like your own story of what, again, government is for. Yeah. Rosie, another con you could have added to the long list is conflict. Mm -hmm. of interest. Mm -hmm. So you lay out, you talked to Mariana about the ecology, the consultancy ecology. So audit, consultancy and outsourcing mm -hmm. are all incredibly helpful if they're all provided by one thing, passing one thing over to the other. Rosie, talk us through how those conflicts grew up to the advantage, as you argued, the consultancy industry in its broader sense. Yeah, great question. So we saw, again, I, I'm kind of wary of just being the nerd in the room and going through the long history of the consulting industry. But um, towards the end of the 20th century, while the rest of uh, markets were also consolidating, we saw professional service firms consolidating their services, right? And um, as we describe in the book, it is no coincidence that it was after this that we saw, uh, so after this period where firms like Arthur Anderson had brought together their professional services firms in consulting and also auditing, mm -hmm. that we saw the crises of Enron and WorldCom. And Enron, you know, was, it was hugely catastrophic for many people. Um, the, the collapse of Enron, I'm not going to kind of go into the whole... You can buy the book and then you'll, uh, <laughs> and then you'll get to find out about what happened with Enron. Now, um, that led in the United States to the introduction of new legislation that would separate or would prevent firms that were providing auditing services from also providing advice to those uh, same firms. But there were some kind of limits to this. There are some limits to this legislation. So companies are still able to, uh, consulting companies are still able to audit, for example, other firms in the same sector that they're providing um, consultancies to. Mm. Um, we describe some very kind of abject conflicts of interest in the book. So, for example, McKinsey, um, we, could, could we always talk about McKinsey a lot. We, we have beef with all of them, not just, not just McKinsey. Um, but um, Mc, McKinsey uh, in, in Puerto Rico was brought in by uh, the, the government there to advise on the debt restructuring um, uh, that, that happened, uh, or that was required um, after uh, Puerto Rico suffered a financial crisis, um, right? And then it was uncovered by some New York Times journalists that the investment arm of McKinsey, MIA Partners, was actually going to benefit from mm. the debt restructuring process. I can't remember now. I've been, I've mm. been told not to 
point to page numbers in the book, but <laughs> you can buy the book, um, uh, 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 was going to benefit kind of huge amounts from uh, the debt restructuring process that McKinsey was advising on. So this is a very kind of clear conflict of interest. Um, now, there are other ways, and we would argue that they're more significant, where the systemic role that the consulting industry plays across our economy represents a kind of bigger conflict of interest and a greater kind of threat to democratic interest to accountability. We all want to know when our governments, for example, are bringing someone in to, uh, to provide advice on how to reach net zero. It would be quite nice as citizens to know if those companies are also standing to benefit from providing advice to fossil fuel companies on how to grow their bottom lines. You know, that's, that's kind of, but whether or not this Chinese wall that consultancies often promise exists between the advice that they give to these companies and government actually exists, it would be nice to know if there is a potential conflict of interest. Now, as Mariana mentioned, we saw in the case of um, Australia's net zero strategy where McKinsey was brought in to develop the modeling um, uh, by the government for this net zero strategy. McKinsey has also worked for or provided advice to at least 43 of the 100 biggest mm. polluters in the world. Is that the kind of company as citizens that we want to be in government providing advice on how we reach net zero? This is a problem not just for you know, climate breakdown and mm. how we stop that, but this is something that also people want, right? People do want governments to be acting on um, the climate crisis. Again, that's not an ideological point, that's a fact. But it's also a point of transparency. No, I mean, yeah. the, the whole point there is both the conflict of interest and the veil of secrecy. So mm. in South Africa, um, a consulting company, the same one is both consulting for the state-owned enterprise, ESCOM, a state-owned energy company, and the Treasury, which in theory is regulating ESCOM. So these, I mean, in terms of the solutions then that, that we go to in the last chapter, it's, you know, Big picture, like we actually need a whole different way of understanding the role of government so that it actually starts to invest within its internal capacity if it's seen as a value creator. But then there's a lot of nitty gritty stuff on the contracts. I mean, it doesn't take much to actually make sure that you have uh, transparency in terms of for any government, like the two examples we just gave, that before you um, uh, uh, accept to have McKinsey uh, advising your treasury that you're also sure it's not advising the state and enterprise, but also that the contracts and embed learning, this issue about the learning by doing that I mentioned before, if you were a therapist and you have a client in therapy for your entire life, you're probably not a very good therapist, right? So there's not really an incentive for the consultants mm. to make sure that the organization that they're working with over time is actually strengthened. And in the case of government, when we say that they've become addicted, it's, 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 not a, it's not surprising. So there's all sorts of ways that you could actually embed in a transparent way from the government's point of view, in terms of what citizens should be demanding in terms of these contracts, uh, learning that we need to make sure this isn't a lifetime consultancy contract because it's actually riding and surfing on this wave of weakening infantilization of that civil service. Yeah, and what you've done, Marianne in the, and Rosie, in the final chapter mm. is come up with this um, structured way of finding solutions. Let's go to questions. I'm looking for the helpful usher. Is that a helpful usher waving at the back or someone who would like to ask a question? I don't know, but I'm pointing at the person at the back who is waving. I would also like to ask rather cheekily, are there any consultants in the building? <laughs> Okay, yes. I'm, going to come, okay. I'm going to come to a couple of you in a second. So I'm going to come to this person down here next, but at the back there to start us off. Yeah. So my question is, to what extent do you think that the two-party political system contributes to this infantilization of government? Hmm. How can a government have a long view and really exercise its role of public service when it is dancing to the rhythm and drama of election? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Rosie, how much is the two-party state to blame for this problem? Maybe there's not enough diversity of politics. I think that's a great question. It's not something we address directly in the book. Uh, maybe that's why you're asking now. Um, I think one thing that's fundamental that we do discuss in the book is to make sure, again, that when governments mm. are doing things, they are in the citizens' interest. So this is something that you know Mariana has written a lot about with um, mission-oriented policy. There is also a question of who sets the missions. How do we make sure that within our political systems, or perhaps by changing our political systems, that the things that governments are mandated mm. to do, 
they not only have the capacity to do them, but they also are kind of democratically developed. But there's also plenty of organizations of, it's not just mission-oriented policy, mission-oriented organizations of the DARPA kind, which have been successful precisely because they are public but not politicized, right? So even the fact that you have the head of the DARPA type institution in the US, which is in power for five years, in those five years are not coinciding with the electrical, electrical, electoral uh, cycle, um, and that the remit is actually to take risks. The UK government actually has tried to copy the DARPA model. There's now this ADIA, I'm pronouncing it like it's an Italian opera, but anyway, ARIA uh, <laughs> organization, but they've kind of forgotten that the whole point of DARPA was, you know, to, and unfortunately, it was a part of the military industrial complex to win the war, but ARPA E is about, you know, really bold missions around energy. ARPA H is around really bold missions around health. And the fact that even in the US, where all the ideology in terms of how they describe themselves is that kind of Jeffersonian kind of idea of the market where actually how they have acted has been the Hamiltonian kind of visible, not invisible hand. They have, in order to do that, they have over the years actually formed these public but not politicized organizations that have actually been responsible for uh, driving a lot of the innovation and the competitiveness of places like Silicon Valley, which were presented to us as a private sector uh, run operation. It was very much public sector, but it was about organizational capacity. In Italy, we had the Istituto della Ricostruzione Italiana. Again, everything in Italian sounds great. Uh, it had three different phases when it was a uh, um, public not politicized, public super politicized, and then privatized. And it was the last two phases that were a complete disaster, which just, again, brings it back to this isn't about public or private. It's that organizational structure, the organizational capacity. And what we talk about the book is we need kind of stronger organizational capacity in all these different types of public, private, third sector actors. But the public bit has really been incredibly weakened. And we can talk about electoral cycles as bringing in short termism. It's definitely true. But we've seen ways to solve that problem. And just talking about kind of elections as though, you know, uh, politicians are just in it to win the election has actually been part of the way that public choice theory and new public management has kind of infiltrated into our uh, MPA programs, because um, we forget actually that many people enter the civil service just because they really care about making the world a better place. Have you ever, have you ever met a nice consultant? Yes. The, the book is absolutely not I'm trying joking, to Mariana, diss consultants. I'm joking. Because there's one right here. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Can I just say, Mariana. <laughs> I can just come in on that yes. point. I'm a graduate of two political science degrees. So a lot of my friends work in consulting. I should just put my cards on the table Excellent. now. Okay. Um, we, we love consultants. And one there's of our one here friends. who's going to ask us a I, fine question. Yeah. I might have lied a little bit. I'm a consultant at the World Health Organization. So technically not a mm. consultant in the sense of what's written in this book, yeah. but um, I have to say, I'm a PhD student at the LSE, and um, consultancies come into our school all the time, and it's very attractive, especially in terms of the uh, salaries compared to public sector, especially mm -hmm. for academics. Um, but I did have a question, and I'm sort of hijacking <laughs> your consultancy, in terms of the proliferation of these consulting firms in global health. Yeah. Um, it's not unusual to see, so for example, in 2022, Boston Consulting Group had a huge presence at the UN uh, Climate Change Conference mm -hmm. in, uh, in Egypt. And I wonder if there's any lessons or if any trend towards these uh, consultancy companies working in global health and what lessons we might learn at the national level. Yeah, well, BCG actually ran COP27 this year. Yeah, <laughs> depressing. In fact, that. Maggie, we should bring you in because you've had an experience with, uh, with consultants in the health sector around FGM. I mean, I don't see the problem in health any different from how I've seen it. I mean, definitely, like, we focus a lot, for example, of what's happening around digital and digital strategies, definitely the climate strategies, the examples we just gave. Health is so important because, you know, I mean, I actually run, I chair a, a council for the World Health Organization called the Council on the Economics of Health for All. So the idea there is that if health for all is the goal, how do you structure the economic system to deliver on that? And we formulated the work around these four kind of principles around value, innovation, finance, and capacity. And the value bit was like, how do we actually have a different 
theory of value, of how value is actually created in the health sector, because all the attempts to reform, whether it's on intellectual property rights and the patent pool, which Dr. Tedros, as you know, called for during COVID-19, there's always this like backlash, oh, well, don't screw with that, because otherwise it's going to hurt innovation. So the narrative of where innovation is coming from, where value is coming from, where wealth creation comes from is so strong that I have really been shocked, actually, even in countries where you have an active health policy or an active climate policy, the, 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 the politicians, the civil servants are often kind of tamed <laughs> by this threat, oh, we're going to leave if you, you know, mess with that system. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just really, I genuinely feel that the first point that we raise in the conclusion, which is that none of this is going to change, none of it, until we have a different narrative of where you know, what the economy is, where growth comes from, where competitiveness, where innovation, where value comes from changes. And in the health area, it's just amazing how powerful the hold <laughs> on, on, on the civil servants' uh, attempt to reform the system is by this threat by basically the pharmaceutical companies that it's going to hurt innovation. And so, you know, it's not a coincidence that I began at least my work with that idea of the entrepreneurial state, which is, well, let's actually look at where, you know, basically everything that makes this thing smart and not stupid, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, all came from public investment. But that's not a point about public money, is it was purpose-oriented public investment. The reason we have the internet is government wanted the satellites to communicate. Internet was the solution to the problem. No one said we need an internet strategy. GPS was a solution to a problem. The Navy wanted to know where the ships were and you know, to track it. So we don't have purpose orientation in our health system today. And the problem in the UK, for example, was not that the private sector entered the health sector. It's that there was no kind of clear goal of what kind of health system we needed. And then the public sector maybe could help on the sidelines to get some stuff done. And so they kind of took over the show. We say that we went from public-private partnerships to private-public partnerships. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, top, there's, there's an usher somewhere. I'm afraid I cannot see the upper floor uh, because of the lighting. There is an usher somewhere with a microphone and who is identifying people to ask questions. Yes, lovely. Thank you so much. Up to the right. Hi there. Um, I'm Lucy Shea from Futera, and uh, we're a consultancy with a mission to make... Sorry, the... I have no idea where you... Oh, there you are. Gotcha. Hi. Yeah, um, hi. <laughs> so we're a mission-orientated consultancy to make the mm. Anthropocene awesome. Um, and I wanted to pick up on this disclosure and transparency piece. And I, I, I actually totally agree. I think narrative is the number one answer. Mm. But in terms of disclosure and transparency, um, we've led this piece to get advertising agencies to disclose kind of who the clients are, basically, like sector by sector, in a, mm. in a, in a similar attempt to kind of say, you can't play both sides. You can't be doing all the lovely net zero youth campaigns here and then taking billions in lobbying from the fossil fuel companies here. And I thought you touched on it, but I would love to expand a little bit. Is, 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 the, is disclosure for the consulting companies, do you think, one of the drivers to create this change? Should we be looking for a similar thing around disclosure of clients and industries or conflicts? I, I, I know you touched on it, but I'd love to hear a bit more. Great. Uh, Rosie, do you want to kick us off there? And then there's a gentleman here towards the back uh, for the usher here. That would be great. Rosie. And we have a consultant over there. <laughs> do we have a proper consultant here? He's who a proper consultant. One of these, right, we have a proper one here. Then this, this person over here. No, no, but the, 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 the chat there first. But uh, uh, Rosie, start the answer, mm -hmm. and I'll point at people in a sort okay. of vague way. Yes, yes. Perfect. I think it's a great question, right? Mm. And we can look at what's happening at the moment with uh, climate disclosure. It's a nice, nice way to start, right? Because uh, mandating companies to disclose their emissions could be part of a solution, could be part of how we get a green transformation. But clearly, that's not going to be enough. It's not working uh, at, at, like as its own thing, right? So mm -hmm. mandating companies, and I think this doesn't, this, you know, we know that self-regulation by markets rarely actually has worked, that's the evidence. Um, so mandating this from governments, mandating uh, consultancies, particularly when they're working with governments, to disclose who they're working with, where they're working, where they derive most of their profits, not necessarily the kind of details about the advice, but their conflicts of interest, is part of the solution. 
But if we're not doing the other things that we call for in the book, if we're not changing our narratives about, and not just a narrative, by the way, the remit of the civil service, if we're not empowering the civil service, if we're not also implementing initiatives to rebuild capacity internally, these other things that we call for. So we, we kind of provide a shopping basket of things that governments are doing around the world and that other governments could be doing. For example, establishing public sector consultancies, particularly to make sure that they don't um, develop a kind of uh, capacity deficit as they move away from this dependence on consultancies, establishing uh, government labs like Laboratorio de Gobierno in Chile, for example, um, uh, uh, that would be another thing, and making sure fundamentally that people want to work for the public sector, that the pay and conditions of the public sector mean that people can actually see themselves going and having a career in the public sector. That's really important, right? Otherwise, people are going to be in and out um, when they look for other things. So in conclusion, to, or in answer to your question, disclosure is part of the solution, but we shouldn't allow uh, disclosure to be seen as the solution. It's not enough. Excellent. Uh, the person there, yes, lovely. Hi there. Uh, my name's Graham. I'm a friendly ex-consultant. I've gone corporate. Um, <laughs> this is it's like, like a therapy session. It's yeah. like, I love this. This is wonderful. I was going to say, like it's like consul of, uh, Consultants Anonymous. Yes. <laughs> I really wanted to ask you about um, the, the context of being purpose-driven in the sense of, is purpose-driven enough to be successful? Because my big question here is, if I think about DWP, I want them to be efficient at getting benefits to people, but mm -hmm. I don't see that they have a moonshot purpose. And I think it'll be very hard to imagine for a number of departments that we just need to get stuff done to, uh, to have that moonshot. So how do you structure an organization that delivers without mm -hmm. measuring what they're delivering. Yeah, so it's not about not measuring. In fact, it's too bad that Mike Bracken is in here. He's one of the uh, people that actually set up GDS, Government Digital Services, uh, which then, uh, um, um, what's the word, not constructed, made, gov.uk, which won an international design award. The history of that project was so interesting because first of all, Government, when it decided, you know, because this is not very moonshotty, right? It's like the digital platform of government. The first thing was they decided to outsource it to Serco. Surprise, surprise, came back with a very huge bill, not a very interesting, dynamic, uh, a, a digital platform. Then it was people within the BBC iPlayer team who were like, oh my God, again, outsourcing to kind of incompetent Circos and G4Ss, we'll do it. So they went to uh, uh, the cabinet office, set up GDS did gov.uk, and the first thing they did was to say, can we please stop talking about citizens as clients and customers? You know, this kind of customer, customerization of the patient in the hospital, the clientelization of, of students and schools. They're users, and it's not even that sexy to talk about users, users with human rights, and we want to set up a really cool, dynamic government platform, digital platform, that actually nurtures, <laughs> nourishes your soul as you're accessing your driver's license, your passport, and so on. So a user-friendly, I'm kind of exaggerating, a user-friendly digital platform that has the person out there, they had this arrow that was always pointing outside to you know, the citizen, the, the, the uh, person using the digital platform from a kind of a user perspective, not so much in terms of efficiency, but literally in terms of kind of having a user-friendly, easy to use, uh, well-designed, just think of what everyone says about these things, they're well-designed, all the technologies I said was government funded, but it's a very well-designed iPhone, that's why we buy it, and they actually brought that sense of design and just making the user experience a fulfilling one and not one that, you know, in the Ken Loach films, you see what happens when you have to fill out all these different forms and in accessing your rights, you kind of lose the will to live. So I'm not saying that it's the perfect gov.uk platform that achieves all, you know, everything that we all need in our welfare states, but it actually required a complete mind shift in what, what it was about. And that was their purpose orientation. The other thing is you talk about, you know, one particular department, it's not you know, that, that idea of having an all of government approach, 
right? Which, which, you know, definitely when, you know, the COVID war room example that you often hear governments that actually did perhaps better than other ones was pre precisely those that actually brought the Minister of Health, the Minister of Finance, the Minister even of, of Energy, given also what was happening in, in many people's uh, uh, housing bills and so on, and especially now, having that all of government approach, interdepartmental, interministerial approach towards emission is itself one of the biggest challenges. It's not necessarily that each department has to have its mission. The point of the mission-oriented policy is precisely to bring sectors outside of their sectoral silos, but also the departments outside of their sectoral silos in the way that I mentioned that NASA realized that they would have never gone to the moon if they continued to have within even that bureaucracy, this kind of very vertical structure. Thanks, Mariana. We're coming to the wars, the end of our time. So sad. So we'd have one more question from up here, and then we're going to have the proper consultant down here to ask the final question. But uh, do kick us off from the balcony. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I had a question about the role of elite universities, which you've alluded to a couple of times uh, in the discussion. So uh, I'm a PhD student, and as my PhD colleague down there is very much aware, you know, these consultancy firms are like super, they're super proliferating in our career spheres and so on and so forth, and they're, and they're seen as attractive places to work for, you know, 21, 22 year old graduates, right? And it seems, it's seen as like a mark of prestige, not only to have gone to an elite university, but also to have gone to these consultancy firms. Mm -hmm. right? And it, it, seem, it seems to say quite a lot about our education system that, mm -hmm. um, that you know, these, that, you know, people, when people get the degrees, when I ask my students, when they, uh, uh, when they uh, what do you want to do after your, what do you want to do with your degree, work for whatever, right? Work for X consultancy or whatever, right? So um, what do you see as, the role of um, the education system, and particularly elite higher education institutions, uh, in in kind of the landscape, in kind of the broader economic landscape in general, and also um, to what extent can we like reverse this kind of increasingly like gamification trend in education, right? Where it's all about prestige and competitiveness, and like you know one-upping your fellow you know degree yep. mates, right? Brilliant. Rosie, uh, you're never allowed to become a consultant now, obviously, but <laughs> no. have, you, have you thought about it and what should we do Surpri about this notion? Surprisingly, no. I mean, my, kind of, my personal reflection, or one kind of personal reflection, and I have actually worked within a consulting firm um, at, uh, on, on secondment when I was with another organisation, which was kind of my first coming mm -hmm. into contact with this. Um, but I guess one of the... My kind of uh, question back to you and to mm. me as well, I'm a PhD student, um, would be, why is it when you are studying at one of these elite universities, do so few people say, I want to go and work for the government when I finish? So this is, yes, a problem of the money that consulting companies, the resources that consulting companies do invest in the careers fairs, right? All of this is very expensive, right? And they do recruit from top universities. They send students on summer schools often. They do summer internships. They have training programs. You know, again, I have lots of friends who've done all of these things. And, and people we interviewed in the book also told us all about this kind of process of bringing people in from like their second year of their undergraduate, right? This is kind of a whole, um, a whole program to, to bring people to consulting rather than other um, uh, industries. The big question, I think, and why, again, this is a systemic issue, an issue with our economies, the question we should be asking is what is government not doing or what is it about how we talk and resource governments that means people don't want to go and work, not necessarily just for the government, but, you know, uh, central government, but for local governments, for NGOs, for other places where they might, or trade unions, you know, other places where they might be able to create public purpose. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would say that this is just an issue for uh, kind of top universities, um, and I certainly wouldn't advocate kind of banning anyone from a careers fair or anything like that. <laughs> but um, and, and, and don't, not? don't I'm not going to let you answer that, Mariana. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> don't, don't don't go and call for that, please, and, and blame us for it. That wouldn't be yeah. very good. Um, but this is a bigger issue, right? About like why is it that so many people want to go and work for these companies, and they do pay slightly better. Not uh, graduate salaries are often not as high as many people assume they are, but they also promise other things as we discuss in the book, they promise that young people are going to uh, find purpose in their job. They're going to find meaning in their job. They're going to have an actual career where they might be able to kind of last more than a year on like a fixed term contract. Um, they're going to be able to maybe get an MBA or continue learning. You know, these are all things I think, you know, the rest of us might want to reflect on what jobs should look like in the rest of society. 
everyone wants to have an impact, everyone wants to learn, everyone wants to create purpose with their, with their jobs. The consulting industry knows this and has uh, co-opted it. Thank you so much. Right, final question. This is going to be a good one. Final much. question. You have to say which consultancy. <laughs> Are you a proper consultant or one of these lovely consultants we've been hearing from so much? I really don't want to perpetuate the, the consultant anonymous session. <laughs> um, but thank you for your compliment about being a proper consultant. <clears throat> who for? Are you allowed to admit who you work for? Or? Uh, I work for myself at the moment, but I represent an organisation that represents 70,000 consultants mm. around mm. the world. Mm. Consultants Trade Union. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> a professional organisation. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that you refer to the big consultancies in your book as the consulting industry is one of the problems that we have with our profession or with that part of our profession. Um, because they have industrialised what should be a professional occupation. Mm. Um, and, and my organisation is horrified at the antics of these people. My question is, what can we do to put things right in the management consultancy profession, or at least in that part which you're calling the industry? And what other actors could we engage to help us do that job? Marianne, that's a very good question because it gives mm. us a nice uplifting end. Mm. What can we do about this issue? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting actually how you introduced it, which is you have consultants who are not necessarily part of the kind of professionalization, or not professionalization, but the industrialization of the sector. And in fact, what we're talking about is the business model behind the large consulting industry, which then is susceptible to all the different kind of dysfunctionalities that we talked about in terms of the conflicts of interests, the lack of transparency, and the recommendations we make in the, in the book, as we just mentioned before, have to do with that. How do you take away that veil of secrecy, bring in transparency, reduce the conflicts of interest, embed learning? But the other thing is, and it'd be interesting actually to throw it back to you, but we probably don't have time for a conversation right now, is the degree to which, from your experience, when consultants of the size of the nature that you're talking about have actually been able to make a living from being on the side, that you're not actually going to the center, you're not replacing the activity that should actually be done by the business sector, by the public sector, but helping these actors from the side do a better job, perhaps being a thorn in their side, but also making them actually become better actors, which in the next round don't need you, right? So. Um, we talk, for example, about lowballing, right? That you often have the, okay, not always McKinsey, but in my case it was McKinsey in the Italian recovery program. We had a, um, I was part of a commission in Italy after, well, during COVID, it was a COVID-19 recovery program. There was like 15 of us working for free in a commission and there was 13 McKinsey folks in the room working for free working for free, taking notes, just making the process a bit more efficient. The idea was that the civil service is, you know, we don't have enough civil servants doing that kind of facilitation job. Hey, we should thank McKinsey, they're all here for free. Lo and behold, what ends up happening later with the contracts that actually uh, transpire after with the, with the recovery program, it's a lot of contracts for McKinsey to the point that actually Draghi then ended up using McKinsey for the next gen EU budget that landed in Italy, right? So that kind of, that itself is a lack of transparency. Being in the room, being in many rooms, working for free, <laughs> uh, helping make government a bit more efficient, and lo and behold, getting huge contracts afterwards. So the degree to which perhaps those that you are working with don't do that, don't do that kind of lowballing. But that requires almost like a, um, uh, inventory of these different practices and being very clear on the ones that are part of this very problematic uh, way of doing business in the sector versus ones that, again, we begin the book with, which is that consultants, when they used to just consult and advise, it was actually a very different sector from being at the center and riding off the waves of a lot of these uh, problematic trends that we've seen in the last 50 years. Fantastic. Very sadly, we are out of time. I just want to end with a quote from Ed Conway, the economics editor of The Times review of mm. this magnificent book by Rosie and Mariana. He says, um, in much the same way as residents of big cities are never more than six feet away from a rat, 
few businesses or political <laughs> decisions take place these days without the involvement somewhere along the line of a consultant. <laughs> Perhaps this book is the first step towards admitting we have a problem. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Rosie. Thank, Thank you, Marianne. Thank you.